everyone. Uh, today we have the pleasure and the honor to receive Jesse uh, Tufixis, PhD candidate in the University of Ottawa in the Department of Classics and Religious Studies, and Norman Raven, fiction author and professor of Jewish literature at Concordia University. And they will present the lecture, A Traveler Disguised, discussing Jewish fiction in the context of the fantastic. Um, before everything, we would like to thank the Association for Canadian Jewish Studies, the Vered Jewish Canadian Studies Program at the University of Ottawa, the Huron University at Western, the Micro Program in Jewish Studies at the University de Montréal, and the FICUM for uh, their support. The lecture will be approximately um, 45 minutes in English, and it will be followed by a bilingual uh, Q&A in French and in English. So, Norman, Jesse, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Alex. Um, it's funny, I sent this, I sent my bio to you guys um, uh, before December. I actually did pass my thesis defense. Uh, so that's, that's all done. Thank you. Um, and in a roundabout way today, we're going to kind of talk about the general contours of my thesis. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll start now. Uh, in the early portions of my thesis, I look into three seemingly unrelated claims about the brilliant Czech Jewish author Franz Kafka, who wrote in German and virtually never mentioned Jews or Judaism in his fiction. Brought together, these three claims about this single author form, rather surprisingly, one possible response to a broad, ongoing, and not fully answerable question in Jewish literary scholarship, which is, what does it mean to write Jewishly? The question of Jewish writing is more complex than it seems at first glance. Is it just stories written by Jewish authors? Surely not. Or the screenplay for, Trans for Transformers 2, written by Alex Kurtzman, would be a potent example of Jewish literature. On the flip side, is it simply stories about rabbis, dibbics, golems, synagogues, and shtetls? Again, this seems to be off the mark, given the fact that some of the most renowned Jewish literary scholars of the 20th century make the first of the three following claims. So this is the first of the claims. The first claim. Dan Miron, George Steiner, and other Jewish literary scholars think of Kafka as the quintessential Jewish author, despite the fact that, according to Miron, he never mentions Jews or Judaism in his fiction. In the words of Steiner, as no other speaker or scribe after the prophets, Kafka knew, and that's new in italics, Kafka knew. Kafka's misery as one coerced into writing, his almost hysterical diffidence before mundane authorship, are the facsimile, perhaps consciously arrived at, of the attempts of the prophets to evade the intolerable burden of their seeing, to shake off the commandment of utterance. So that's the first claim, that Kafka is the quintessential Jewish author, even though he doesn't write about Jews and Judaism. The second claim, Lubomir Dolagel, not a scholar of Jewish literature at all, but one of the literary scholars responsible for possible world's literary theory, performs a case study at the end of his monograph, Heterocosmica, in order to show how his theory works. He chooses to explore a literary category he calls the modern myth, a secularized counterpart of the classical myth, where even the most bizarre of occurrences are not authenticated as the supernatural action of otherworldly forces. According to Dolagel, the author most emblematic of the modern myth is Franz Kafka. And here's the third claim. The third claim, Nancy Trail, one of Dolagel's possible world's contemporaries, applies possible worlds theory to the literature of the fantastic, which branches into the subcategories of horror fiction, gothic fiction, paranormal fiction, and others of that ilk. She claims that the paranormal mode of fantastic fiction is, quote, taken to its limit by none other than Franz Kafka. So if Kafka is the quintessential Jewish author and the quintessential author of the modern myth and the quintessential author of the, par of the paranormal, then it stands to reason that there is some kind of connection between those categories of Jewish writing, modern myth, and the paranormal. Let's, to simplify, let's say Jewish writing and paranormal writing or the literature of the fantastic. Now, my thesis was not about Kafka. Uh, it was actually about eight short stories by Canadian and American Jewish authors who lived in different times and places. But Kafka serves as something of a hermeneutical key, a cipher by which we might understand the implied connection between these categories and seek to craft one response among many possible responses to the question of what it means to write Jewishly. All that to say, the topic of this discussion between Norm and myself is this. Would it be helpful to look at modern Jewish fiction 
through the lens of the fantastic. So in my thesis, I identified liminality marked especially by an implied porousness between the human and non-human worlds as a point of connection between those categories of Jewish writing and the, the fantastic. I focused on the ways both implicit and explicit in which liminal zones and figures featured throughout these eight stories, which I'll name in a second. I identified three prominent themes related to liminal zones, transit and wandering, darkness, dreariness, dreariness and night, and dream states and visions. And then three, three themes related to liminal figures. So the dead and undead, aliens, outsiders, and others, and what I called uh, the foolish sage and other hidden identities. And I analyzed the eight short stories accordingly. So these were the eight short stories. There was At Sea by Lamed Shapiro, who lived 1878 to 1948. A Myriad Minded Man by A.M. Klein, who lived 1909 to 1972. The Lecture by Isaac Bashevis Singer, who lived 1903 to 1991. Edge's Revenge by Chava Rosenfarb, who lived 1923 to 2011. Die Große Liebe by Arie Lev Stolman, who was born in 1954, still alive. A Dream of Sleep by Steve Allman, born 1966. Dreaming in Polish by Amy Bender, born 1969. And The Mystics of My Land, Part 1, Lev, by Sigal Samuel, who was born in 1986. So a wide breadth of people who lived in, in Canada, America, born in Ukraine, uh, you know, first generation uh, or third generation uh, kids living in Canada, that sort of thing. So returning to Kafka for a second. In their discussions around Kafka, Jewish literary scholars like Miron and Steiner focus on the trial, very famous story. Dolezal does as well, but he gives special attention to a very short, little known Kafka story called The Hunter Gracchus. And I'll turn it over to Norm to talk about that for a second. So Jesse does a lot of hard work to set up that very broad context. It's well, and it's well set up. Um, and the two propositions are very substantial. The centrality of Kafka on one hand, and then the role or the meaning or the importance of genre, certain kinds of writing, and the relationship. Um, and there, there's an awful lot that comes to mind. Um, so just before I say a, a couple of things that came to mind when uh, Jesse raised this particular story, I would I would just say that um, you know when Kafka, he, he's had there's been many Kafka waves. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what Kafka wave we're in, but uh, the earliest Kafka waves were not associated, of course, with his with his Jewishness. That was not of people's uh, interest at the time. And it had to do with other kinds of existential kind of uh, motifs that people really related to after the Second World War in particular. So he seems like a writer who will continue to, you know, receive these waves. Uh, so it's interesting and challenging to receive him in, in a wave that's placing him back in the Jewish context. Um, and then the choice of works, of course, is so crucial. So Jesse sent me back to the Hunter Gracchus, which I hadn't read since I was probably 23 years old or something like that. So it was neat to see it. And it's a beautiful little thing. And uh, it's, it's not like other stories, really, although it has certain elements that you recognize from Kafka, like the sort of the ghostly and over important bureaucratic voice who appears you know, later on. But then the other things that are happening are a little bit more like a Star Wars movie or something fantastic. So it is, it is an unusual story. You, you would think you would want it in this context. And it has to do with the arrival of this kind of death beer a figure on it who is a bit like a golem figure, although that's not made explicit, but it sort of was what I felt. And then the movement of that beer into a kind of sort of weird urban setting when some characters kind of come around and, and, and gather around it. And then the surprising thing is that the, the thing on the beer is this, this undead figure. So it, it really is uh, unusual and it really is rich. And it really is kind of pointing in those directions. And I suspect that people like George Lucas didn't ever look at it, but maybe I'm wrong. But it really does give you that science fiction feeling of a sort of a twilight territory into which something moves, which you don't quite recognize, which then turns out to be in some kind of liminal zone. 
uh, and then is a creature that we can't quite pin down. So it's a perfect case for thinking about Kafka on these fronts. And naturally, once you've done all that, you don't find anything important around Jewish thematics. So it's it's really, it's a good signal of how the choice of the material is so important for which Kafka you want to find. That, that would be the way I would start to think about the things you're saying. I mute myself. Okay. Um, so returning to what Trail is saying about possible worlds um, in the context of the fantastic. So she describes the paranormal mode pretty succinctly in her book, Possible Worlds of the Fantastic. She writes, supernatural and natural are no longer mutually exclusive. The opposition loses its force because we can't we, because we find that the word supernatural is merely a label for strange phenomena latent within the natural domain. Clairvoyance, telepathy, and precognition, for example, are taken to be as physically possible as any commonplace human ability. Um, so I would argue that this short story, this very small story, the Hunter Gracchus, um, however short it is, does fit into this discussion that Trail is having about the paranormal and fiction. Um, so Norm described, uh, described the story very well. I'm going to read a quote from it, and I'll share my screen so you can read along with me. Uh, so my apologies. Um, so this is uh, at the point that the burgomaster, that's uh, you know the mayor of this of this town of Riva, um, basically raises this character from his slumber or death or sleep. We don't know exactly what's going on. We never do. So the burgomaster asks this person. Are you dead? Yes, said the hunter. As you can see, many years ago, it must be an immense number of years in the Black Forest that's in Germany, I plunged down from a rock as I was pursuing a shamwa. Since then, I am dead. But, you, but yet you are also alive, said the burgomaster. As it were, said the hunter, in a certain sense, I am also alive. My death barge missed the passage, a steering error, a moment of inattentiveness by the boatswain, a distraction through my fair homeland. I don't know what it was. I only know that I remained on the earth and that since then my barge has been flying the earthly waters. And so after my death, I, who only desired to live in my mountains, travel through all the countries of the world. And you have no part in the hereafter, asked the burgomaster, wrinkling his brow. I am, replied the hunter, always on the big staircase leading upward. On this endless, wide and open staircase, I hang, I hang about higher up, further down, on the right, on the left, always in motion. The hunter has turned butterfly. Don't laugh. I'm not laughing, said the burgomaster defensively. <laughs> so, um, I also think that in, if we're talking about this in the context of Jewish writing, um, other Jewish stories fit in very nicely um, on a rather explicit level. Now, there's also the implicit level I'll talk about in a moment, but let's Let's just, for the sake of argument, talk about this explicit level. So, um, for example, in I.L. Peretz's story, The Dead Town, which predates Kafka by many years, uh, we have a similar kind of liminality between life and death, the dead and the undead. Uh, so in that story, uh, the narrator is wandering the countryside in the evening when he happens upon a strange little coachman. Uh, the coachman tells him about a town of Jews who, quote, don't live in geography at all. He tells the narrator that this is a veritable ghost town and offers to tell him more if you'd like. The narrator implies, uh, implores him to, uh, to continue. And just before the coachman can tell his gloomy tale, the reader is given a perfectly gothic description of the atmosphere. So let's look just at that atmosphere. Meanwhile, it was getting on toward evening. In the west, where the sun had set, the sky turned red as blood in the milky east. Like a bride beneath her veil, a, a full moon swam into sight, its pale shimmering beams blending with the flickering phantoms of the silent, melancholy night. It was an eerie sight. We entered a small forest. The moon shone down through the trembling leaves. Little circles of light danced like silver coins among the fallen leaves of branches on the ground. There was magic in the air, in the quiet rustle of the woods. So. I won't go into all the details of the rest of the story in which the coachman describes how the town came to be overrun with the living dead who came up from their graves, but I'll describe the ending because I think that's the most salient point. He tells the narrator that the dead descended upon homes throughout the region 
and the townsfolk were too busy bickering and feuding over inane issues to notice. So he says, before long, the dead took over. Today, they're the bulk of the community and its leaders. Naturally, they don't bring children into the world, but whenever anyone dies, they steal the corpse from its deathbed or its grave, and there's one more dead person in town. Everyone in town, he tells the narrator, is a corpse. The rabbi is a corpse, the cantor is a corpse, and the entire rabbinical court are corpses. That's why, he says, wherever you go, there's such a, sten uh, there's such a stench in the air, in the synagogue, in the bathhouse, in the street. There are corpses all around you. The story ends with a question that is now naturally on the mind of the reader, with a perfect answer in the context of this discussion of liminal figures and the fantastic. The narrator, the narrator asks him, and you, my friend, what exactly are you? I'm only half dead, answered, answered the Jew, and jumping out of the wagon, he disappeared among the trees. And that's how the story ends. Norm, did you want to respond to, to that? So it's it's neat to set Peretz up. Um, he's, he's surely an impetus and an influence. Um, although writers like Kafka wouldn't have acknowledged so. And Jesse sent me back to see if in the diaries there was much attention to Peretz. And of course, Kafka was paying attention to Yiddish writing, but Peretz was not the one that he most likely thought he was he was being influenced by. But um, once you read these early stories and think about the way they work in the Yiddish folkloric context, it is kind of inescapable to consider that these things these things are lurking, these things are floating for Kafka. Um, and then his access, of course, is not through the original, but through what he hears in cafes when things are read aloud and then translated. So it's kind of a translated culture to some degree. And he's also fascinated, of course, with uh, Eastern European folkloric culture as something other. So I don't know how this could be said to relate to the way we or different kinds of audiences relate to ideas of the fantastic or ideas of folklore, but uh, Kafka was sure uh, impressed by them as to some degree things from the past, uh, from a Jewish world that he uh, in some way was drawn to and in other ways had, had trouble entering or, or had trouble comprehending. So I think, I think of it that way as a kind of a translation project on his part. Um, the idea probably being that he hadn't read this er early story of, of Parrots, but uh, we can't, can't say for sure. Um, but then a few things on the Parrots front. So this is a kind of a a big package that sits alongside the things that uh, Jesse's thinking about in relation to Kafka. Um, how do I put it? Uh, when you read this story in full, it's often hard with parrots to decide what's a joke and what's not. Uh, and maybe in Kafka that's true too. But um, in, in Peretz's case, a lot of what proceeds in this kind of a story is a joke and is to some degree satire. So a way of characterizing and caricaturing Jewish life in the time in which he's writing. So I had to go check. So the story supposedly is circa 1895. Um, and in that way, he had just recently gone on a long ethnographic trip that he took through parts of Poland paid for by a rich Polish Jew who had converted to Christianity to see how the, uh, the rambling outlying lands uh, were looking and how the communities were. So to some degree, the stories that come out of that are, they are actual portraits. Uh, and some of what we encounter in a story like this may certainly may actually have happened. So one would have to go do all the work to figure out if there's diaries or letters that account for the night that he met this character and then this liminal thing takes place. Yeah. Uh, so this is a bit like Kafka. You, you always profit from going back if you can to find out how this incredibly fanciful seeming story might also relate to life. Uh, and that complicates things, I guess, even further because the movement into genre or the movement into magic or into liminal space um, is also really very much linked to the real world. Uh, and last thing I'll say then is that with parrots, you know, you think about the audience. Um, so very popular writer, everybody's reading him. 
he's the Dickens of the of the Yiddish literary world of that time. Uh, and in that way, his readership is largely secularized, you could say pretty confidently, but pretty knowledgeable about things religious. So the territory on which he's moving may be a little bit more like uh, understandable than the one that Kafka is moving on, where his own movements between different sort of possibilities or possible worlds and sort of create creative ideas may, might be said to be more individual or more closed. Whereas the joke, if there's jokes involved in, in the parrot story, is a little bit more open to the readers. So that, that would sort of be a, a, you know, another discussion. Yeah. So actually on that note about, you know, people coming to these stories, um, with a knowledge of Jewish storytelling and Jewish folklore and all these things. Um, that would actually sort of be my next point. So these narrative elements that I'm talking about are not always as explicit as a, as a dead person who is also in a certain sense alive or a figure who is stuck in that liminal position of voyaging aimlessly between the living and the dead. Um, rather, I would say many of these markers are, are very implicit and might require an understanding of earlier Jewish storytelling um, to suss out those elements. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, staying up in the middle of the night to study and delve into divine secrets uh, or connect with other worldly beings is a hallmark of Jewish storytelling from before the time of the Talmud. Um, so when, for example, uh, Mr. N, the protagonist of Isaac Besheva Singer's uh, The Lecture, spends all night awake being transported to the other world of his traumatic memories of Treblinka and Majdanek, we as readers, if we understand that, that context, can make that implicit connection between a this-worldly story and the otherworldly happenings of more mystically-oriented texts. Uh, and, for example, when we read uh, story after story that's heavily imbued with notions of wandering and transit, uh, like the protagonist of Kava Rosenfarb's Edge's Revenge, wandering the German countryside after her liberation from the camps, or the way Singer be begins his story with the words, I was on a train from New York to Montreal, uh, and so many other stories that start with, I was at a train station, or I was already in movement, I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Uh, we might, as readers, make the connection between these instances and the many Jewish tales of wandering seers, of exiled Jews, and transit between our realm and the heavenly academy. So I'll read a, a quote from uh, Achava Rosenfarb uh, from Egea's Revenge. Um, actually, I put this in the wrong sequence. There we go. Uh, I then drifted from one end to the other of that devastated German countryside, trying to escape from myself and from others, regardless of whether they were the conquerors or the conquered. The sight of a human face disgusted me, but with the passing of time, lonely, loneliness set up such a howling inside me that I could no longer endure it. And I attached myself to a group of former concentration camp inmates who were wandering from one camp to another in search of relatives. They had come from the English zone and not one of them was, was a native of my hometown. Um, sorry, I went to the wrong window here. Um, just a second. Okay. Um, and when Lama Shapiro, uh, when Lama Shapiro's protagonist in At Sea finds himself blanketed in mist and fog on a cross-ocean journey to America, transported into visions of the, uh, of the shtetl that he left. Uh, we might make the connection to the biblical prophets who received their words from God in dreams and visions, or the dream talks of Rabbi Nachman of Breslov, or any number of other instances that involve dreams, visions, and anything like that. So let's uh, read from Lama Shapiro's At Sea, um, where he describes another scene like this. So, the night has grown wet, a thin, pale drizzle of unknown origin drives into the darkness, slowly merging with it, washing it ever grayer. The drab depths blur the vision, making it more and more difficult to distinguish any defined feature. One imagines the air crowded with unidentifiable, trembling, fluttering creatures, that soon, very soon, one will glimpse a few soft, rounded forms that evaporate before they come to rest, that die before they are born. That unforgettable crepuscular moment has arrived when the flow of time halts between the night that has been and the day that may be, when the angel of sleep pours out upon the earth the full potency of its enchantment, when during the days of awe, sleepy Jews in my shtetl wander like night spirits along the darkened streets to the synagogue, 
dreaming as they walk. Several taps of our old Beatles wooden mallet reach my ears, sounds that were born when I was still a child, that for many years sought me across the world, and that have now caught up with me in the middle of the foaming sea. And my heart beats faster in response. The long, long distance, uh, the long, long distant past and the brief transitory present merge. The real world turns into a dream and dreams become reality. The dozing little houses of my dear shtetl twirl and rock around our ship. The old synagogue, its ancient attenuated gelder, rose struggling for life next to it, swims past. And then bringing it back to the question of the dead and the undead, when A.M. Klein's character, Isaiah L Ellenbogen, describes how the people in his town believe ghosts go to the synagogue at midnight, or Singer's protagonist describes his night with a dead body and the bony fingers reaching up from under his bed trying to grab at him, or the protagonist in Amy Bender's Dreaming in Polish goes to Holocaust museums to speak with the dead and comfort them. We might make that connection between these tales and the myriad stories of Divix and Hauntings, or Parrots is the Dead Town, or Kafka's The Hunter Gracchus, even if it's not this explicit thing of undead creatures and all this stuff, we can make that implicit connection to those stories. Um, so here's a passage from Stolman's story, um, in which his narrator describes his nebulous memory of a strange old woman who helped his mother on the night of his father's funeral. The old woman had silently helped my mother put away the food that had been set up on the dining room sideboard and then clean up the kitchen. Years later, when my mother herself was gravely ill, I took a leave from college to take care of her. She would not allow herself to be admitted to a hospital or permit strangers into the house. I asked her about the old woman. I wondered whatever became of her. My mother lifted her head off her pillow and gave me a surprised look. Oh no, there was never such a person that day. Recently, however, now that I'm well into my 40s, approaching the ages when my parents died, and I think back to this late exchange with my mother, I find myself inc increasingly alarmed. I can no longer conjure up a single one of the old woman's features. Did she have a long or a short nose? What was the color of her eyes? How did she wear her hair? I recall only a sense of her frail, ghostly movements, the vague disruption of the still atmosphere of our, ho of our house and her parting words. So again, this is not an, an explicit, this is not a ghost story. I don't believe reading this that he's trying to say this was a ghost that appeared to me. But the verbiage used, the, the language used, harkens back to these ideas um, of the dead in daily life, uh, of the idea of being both dead and in a certain sense alive. So my point in bringing up these ideas is that even if these stories do not authenticate supernatural powers or occurrences of any kind, they imply a narrative realm where otherworldly journeys are in a certain sense, to use Kafka's term, in a certain sense possible, where the dead are in a certain sense alive, where protagonists are in a certain sense delving into mysteries in the middle of the night, and in a certain sense having cosmically, cosmically important dreams and visions. Hmm. These topics appear throughout these eight, these eight stories. I've given you really just a couple of examples, uh, but they are throughout these eight stories um, that are written by different authors from different times and places, different general locales, um, for example, Lama Shapiro was uh, an alcoholic male immigrant from Ukraine who had lived through a pogrom, lived in New York City at the turn of the 20th century. Sigal Samuel is a highly educated 30-something female author born and raised in Canada, living and writing in Montreal in 2015. And yet they still use the same terms, the same literary allusions to make their points. Um, Obviously not the exact identical, but within that realm, within those those six uh, categories that I that I made, um, or that I that I showed before. Uh, so obviously this is not a, a blanket statement for all of Jewish fiction writing, uh, but I I do believe that it, it rings true for a sizable sample of of Jewish stories, uh, and that's whether authors realize that they're doing it or not, and whether readers have the context to understand each and every thing. I think it is part of this storytelling realm, uh, at least as it applies to these eight short stories and perhaps a, a larger sample size. Um, Norm, did you want to, to jump in? Sure, well, the, the one that among your set, they're all so neat and contrasting and the strangest I think is the Shapiro. So maybe if you put him back, yeah. if, if you can. Um, 
And it's the second part where the language starts to become, a, I don't know if this, you know, is this translation suitable? That unforgettable crepuscular moment has arrived. So it's the thing that this does for me in relation to the others is uh, it, it makes you think, oh, yes. And Jews were always being, Jewish writers were always being influenced by this sort of array of possibility, sort of array of ideas secularizing tendencies, but also science, if, if this is a properly translated um, mm -hmm. se section. Um, and in that way, the thing Jewish, so the way that you set things up so clearly from the start and you were sort of relying on Miron and others, um, then is really something quite idiosyncratic and it will sort of vary from, from writer to writer. Um, and in that way, then it's, it's such a tough challenge because in each case, you kind of have to go back to see the context or the circle around which the writer, uh, uh, in, in which he or she existed to sort of appreciate how did this thing arrive at the place that it arrived at. So my uh, single case to compare alongside uh, Jesse's uh, drawn from his um, recent research is a, a writer who's sort of, uh, Haunt, haunted my life and work since I was a university student myself, Bruno Schultz. Um, and in this section that I thought of, coincidentally, the language turns in the direction of the Shapiro, and then maybe I can be a little bit clearer about what I am trying to say, but the quote from Isaac Basheva Singer that always was on the back of Schultz books, I don't know if it still is, but I have this really old edition. Uh, Schultz cannot be easily classified he can be called a surrealist, a symbolist, an expressionist, a modernist. He wrote sometimes like Kafka, sometimes like Proust, and at times succeeded in reaching depths that neither of them reached. So it, it's a case where um, Singer likes to say, I with, I with Schultz move Kafka aside. Um, so there's a, there's a kind of relationship between the two. So maybe in the larger picture that uh, Jesse's introduced, Schultz does want to enter. Um, and the Shapiro thing helps me give you a sense as I read a kind of a longish paragraph of, in translation from the Polish, how Schultz sounds pretty uh, unpredictably like a whole bunch of things, uh, mostly not Jewish, so that um, the possibilities are really many. And maybe in, in that way, he he's presenting a bit like Kafka. So the the title story of the book that I'll read from is called The Cinnamon Shops, uh, very closely based, closely bonded to uh, Schultz's own uh, lifetime home, Drachowicz, in um, what's now Ukraine. Uh, and so the stories are often descriptive of the place itself, but then they move off in these kind of, I don't know what the right word is, uh, unexpected directions. So the youth is, is traveling through the, the place, and he goes like this. I may have a slightly different, yeah, it looks like it's gonna be the same. Lent wings by my desire to visit the cinnamon shops. I turned into a street I knew and ran rather than walked, anxious not to lose my way. I passed three or four streets, but still there was no sign of the turning I wanted. What is more, the appearance of the street was different from what I had expected, nor was there any sign of the shops. I was in a street of houses with no doors and of which the tightly shut windows were blind from reflected moonlight. On the other side of those houses, I thought, must run the street from which they were accessible. I was walking faster now, rather disturbed, beginning to give up the idea of visiting the cinnamon shops. All I wanted now was to get out of there quickly into some part of the city I knew better. I reached the end of the street, unsure where, where it would lead me. I found myself in a broad, sparsely built up avenue, very long and straight. I felt on me the breath of a wide open space. Close to the pavement or in the midst of their gardens, picturesque villas stood there, the private houses of the rich. In the gaps between them were parks and walls of orchards, the whole area looked like Lezianska Street in its lower and rarely visited part. The moonlight filtered through a thousand feathery clouds like silver scales on the sky. It was pale and bright as daylight. Only the parks and gardens stood black in the silvery landscape. 
So you kind of never know what you're going to get as you go through the course of the long paragraph. Uh, you get lots of the things that Jesse highlights in the contrasting pieces that he's thought about more carefully in, in his thesis and in the way that he's presented things here. Um, and in Schultz too, this kind of strange premonition of science fiction, <laughs> and, and, and I don't know what else to call it, but Blade Runner, um, uh, entry into places expected that end up being things not expected. So other. Um, and then I don't know in what way this potential and this kind of riff on the things that Jesse lays out in his different contrasting examples kind of present a, a different set of possibilities. And of course, it's not the only thing Schultz does. And then true to him too, very like Kafka, hard to get the, the Jewish uh, foundation or element, maybe even harder. But maybe that's no. There's no point in saying. May I just sound like singer when I say that? Hard to get the the Jewish element. But then once he's uh, Jesse's drawn these kind of brackets for us. You know, you have all the different pieces to sort of contrast. Uh, it's a good challenge. Um, I, I, are you ready to to close up shop now? Yes, sure. All right. So okay. I think th this is such a painful thing for me to do because my thesis is 300 pages and we get to talk for 45 minutes. Um, <laughs> but I think a succinct way to end this discussion uh, would be to say, um, these elements that fit into the fantastic and the paranormal in many ways that I did not have the time to describe. Um, this is the way I, I would end it. Horror, Gothic and paranormal fiction all under the umbrella of the fantastic, are subcategories of categories tucked away in the annals of Western literature as, at best, intriguing niche tales about the otherworldly, and at worst, as prurient, schlocky, weird tales. They are always prominently labeled under those titles and categories, and we are reminded of their otherness by publishers, press, reviewers, and academics at every turn. But, on the flip side, the stories we discussed today that do incorporate those elements are simply Jewish stories written by some of the best known masters of Jewish storytelling. Shapiro was exceptionally appreciated by other Yiddish authors. Uh, the way I put it is your favorite author's favorite author. Um, A.M. Klein is considered chief among Canadian Jewish writers. I.B. Singer won the Nobel Prize in Literature and is another who could be considered emblematic of Jewish writing in his own way. Kava Rosenfarb is one of the most admired of Holocaust writers, especially those who wrote in Yiddish. And they are not, we don't call them spooky Jewish writers or authors of the Jewish fantastic or Jewish Gothic fiction. fiction. They're just Jewish writers. And I think it's fascinating that they don't get bracketed, bracketed uh, in their Jewish writing by utilizing the same themes and motifs that people might in writing literature of the fantastic. Um, I think it's fascinating. I think it's it's worthy of study um, that this is just considered Jewish writing. This is not considered within some subcategory of a sub of a sub subcategory of a subcategory. Um, I think it's it's notable. So I think I'll I'll end there. We've done our, our forty five minutes. Thank you, Norm. Thank you both again for this fantastic thanks lecture. For yeah, thanks for having us. And thank, thank you, Norm. Bye. This was a good time. My pleasure. Thank mm -hmm. you.